Hey, Fedheads, welcome to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings. This is Sharing Our Pairings, episode 118, Camacho X, Cigar Dojo Imperial Stout Barrel Age. It's a bit of a mouthy title. We're going to have to work on that as the show goes, uh, but that is what the title is right now. I'm your host, John, the Cigar Surgeon, and we are broadcast live around the world, picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network, hosted at CigarFederation.com. You can check out the YouTube stream after the show, but of course, everyone can tune in live at CigarFederation.com or Facebook Live. Thanks to all our podcast listeners out there. I know you guys are listening around the world in a whole bunch of countries. Thanks for supporting the show. I'm joined, as always, by Trippy Trent. Trippy. What's going on, buddy? What is up? Uh, this cigar just like while you were talking caught me by surprise. The retro hail just got crazy spicy. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'm doing good. So, first of all, thanks very much to Trippy for being the sponsor of this week's show. Um, he uh, purchased uh, from Cigar Dojo. He purchased the uh, Camacho uh, Imperial Stout Barrel Age, and I think when we both saw this hit on i think it was facebook initially we both kind of went a little bananas because this is right up our alley yeah as soon as i saw the announcement for this one i was like well i need that one uh we have to do an episode with that gotta have it now you you've smoked the uh camacho barrel age correct yes and have you smoked the new camacho nicaraguan i've smoked one i've smoked two actually i smoked one at ipcpr and one at home um and I like them both, uh, but I found the the Nicaraguan barrel age was lacking in flavor a little bit. I I thought the so I was expecting the Nicaraguan barrel age to be a little bit more intense than the yeah. American barrel aged, and it was definitely subtler. And I think, and I mean, I've got a review pending, but spoiler alert: my note was if you don't retrohale the Nicaraguan barrel aged, I think you're gonna I think you're gonna miss out. I think. That there's a lot of nuance and subtlety there that I wasn't expecting, and I think a lot of that comes through in the retrohail. And if you if you don't retrohail, you might find that a little less complex than what you're anticipating. But I I love the whole barrel age series, the whole concept of barrel aging. It's great. Yeah, I completely agree, and I couldn't have said it better. Uh, it's it is it's just more nuanced and more refined than I was expecting it to be. Not that that's a a, a really bad thing. It's just, uh, it's to me, it smoked more like a Davidoff than a Camacho. That's, you know what? That's a good way to put it. And and, and that's not a knock on Davidoff. It's just that not Davidoff wrong. is known for subtle, nuanced. I mean, that's that's always been their jam. And like it or not, you know, the core line of Davidoff is very nuanced and appeals to a really, really broad range of cigar smokers uh, for an ultra premium cigar. So, like I said, when they started doing the Barrel Age series, uh, I, lo- I love that manufacturers are starting to get into barrel aging. I think mm-hmm. when done right, we've certainly seen, you know, like uh, the Quattro Cinco from Hoya de Nicaragua, which I absolutely go bananas over. I've got a box. I need another box because I'm like halfway through my box. And that's another example of something that's barrel aged. And I think you can do barrel aging really, really well. And I think there's a lot of companies that have done barrel aging tobacco quite well. Yeah, when I first started hearing about barrel aging, I I didn't like the idea of barrel aging tobacco. But now that I've tried it, uh, I'm a fan, and I'm excited for more companies to to be doing this in the future. And I, and I got to say, I was a big fan of because I think you know maybe three four years ago, Camacho was kind of in I don't want to say neutral, but they weren't really wowing the marketplace. And then Davidoff came in, did a did a massive rebranding. Uh, made the packages bold, and they came came out with their sort of bold uh, jury of the or not uh, jury of the bold ju- ju- bold judges series, like this whole mm-hmm. in your face packaging styling with a piano gloss finish, and they they've I think they've done a great job of of putting it back in the face of people who probably smoked a lot of Camacho back in the day, and maybe they moved away from it for whatever reason, and I think you know f- for our stores uh, they perform very very well and. I I like all of them, frankly. I think the Connecticut is fantastic. The Triple Maduro. I mean, God, I've been smoking the Triple Maduro for like ten years, and the uh, Corojo is uh, is a little spicy meatball, which I'm, yeah, uh, I like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. And I really like. So the first time I'd seen it in person was at IPCPR, but I really like those those Davidoff uh, kind of the the four foot shelf sections that they have. Yes, uh, Davidoff's been doing that forever. And of course, now that I think it was last year, they started doing it with 
with Camacho. And with Camacho, I feel like it works really well. Yeah, it pops. I mean, you know, as a B&M owner, or I guess I'm not a B&M owner, as, as a general manager for a chain of B&Ms, I can say that it's really, really tough. And I see where a lot of American B&Ms struggle with, and manufacturers struggle with getting their product noticed on the shelf. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any problem with Camacho being noticed on the shelf. I mean, it not at pops. all. You know, yeah. you're used to these sort of dark brown or blonde style boxes that are really just boxes. I mean, some of them are very nice. And then you get this piano uh, black or this piano orange or the piano yellow. And I mean, like you can see those from across the store. I mean, they pop. Yeah, yeah, pop. they really I, I've been really impressed with Davidoff's branding in the last few years. Uh, what they've done with Avo and mm-hmm. Camacho in the last couple of years has been uh I think just really good marketing on their part. So I hope they continue this style of board of the bold. That's what it is. Not judges the bold, the board of the bold. And you know, the, even like you look at the band, so I'm going to hold that up and hopefully I'm going to switch to my camera here and hopefully the uh, audience can see that a little bit better. So even, you know, it says got got flavor notes on the band, which I think, you know, little subtle and it's not obnoxious. It's stylish chocolate, malt and hops, uh, you know, immense uh, viscosity, flavor. You know, they've got all these power words on there, and it's just kind of one of those nice finishing touches. It kind of reminds me a little bit of a really nice craft beer, really. Yeah. One one of the the only negative I can find with these bands, I think they're really well designed. But where's the front? Which mm. which side is the front of this thing? Yeah. The yeah. The front logo is all the way around. Yeah. The logo. Could probably stand to be a little bigger, a little wider, maybe take up, because if you look at the band, the the band kind of takes up only about half, or the the logo, I should say, only takes up about half of the band. And if you expanded that, I mean, I'm not a design guy, but I'm just saying, if you expanded that out, you'd probably make that Camacho pop a little bit more. Yeah. But, you know, really, at this point, we're reaching. Really. Yeah, exactly. Um, they've, I think the point is their branding is very on point. <laughs> uh-huh. So walk us through a little bit trippy of, um, what's the deets on this, on this newest monster creation. And, and by the way, I think they're still available. I think you can, they are not, I checked today. They oh, are no. sold out. <laughs> well, um, I take it back, but they did, uh, there was, I, I don't remember exactly how they phrased it in the announcement, but they did say that this is technically the first batch. Um, if they want to, they can they can make more. They should make more. Um, so I'll start with the story. So Eric, Master Sensei over at Cigar Dojo, uh, he was working on coming up with a cigar uh, for their next release. And he actually reached out to Oscar Blues before they released the Barrel Age 1050 and said, 1050 is like our beer. I think the story said that they uh, they kind of selected 1050 to represent Cigar Dojo. That like, like that's their signature beer, kind of. Um, and he reached out to Oscar Blues and said, "Is there any chance you guys are barrel aging some of this stuff? Because we want to barrel age tobacco inside of 1050 barrels." And they said, "Well, it just so happens that we just finished a full production canning of barrel aged." 1050 and we have 30 barrels uh so they ended up buying four four barrels and i'll talk about this more when i get to the beer um but the beer was actually it's kind of a uh a vatted kind of uh aging where they aged it in a bunch of different barrels so like solera style really yeah they aged it in a bunch of barrels from different distilleries and then vatted all that together before canning it right um but eric got a hold of four barrels that were all from Heaven Hill. So Heaven Hill Distillery, you might know from Larceny, Elijah Craig, Evan Williams, Henry McKenna, uh, Old Fitzgerald. So all of those are Heaven Hill Distillery. So the barrels that all of the uh, barrels that had an influence on these cigars were from Heaven Hill. And then those were sent down to Honduras. They aged the uh, signature Honduran Corojo that, you know, Camacho's made famous for six months. And then, so that's a filler tobacco, the Honduran Corojo. This also has 
uh, Brazilian and Dominican Maduro in the fillers. The binder is original Coho, Corojo Maduro, and the wrapper is San Andreas Maduro. Um, so this is actually based on the triple Maduro. Nice. Uh, just one of those fillers was barrel aged for six months. Um, they only made 4,000 cigars for this run, um, and the MSRP on these is, is about 10 bucks, 9.95 I think, or 9.99. Um, and they were sold exclusively through smoking. And I think that price point kind of reflects what we've seen with barrel aged cigars. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to keep in mind that barrel aging, uh, transportation of barrel factors in the cost. One of the things I just want to note here, because I've heard a lot of stories about different manufacturers and smoke production. This cigar, much like the Camacho Triple Maduro, is putting off just a monster amount of smoke. You take a puff yeah, and you blow it and you can just see the smoke billowing from both ends of the cigar. Like it's yeah, nuts. It's- it, this thing's kind of a chimney. Uh-huh. It smokes like crazy. And I think that's that's due to Maduro. I mean, yeah. the process of creating Maduro wrapper is aging it past the point of fermenting so that it's actually been fermenting for months or sometimes or years. years. Yeah, uh, And you end up with just tons of oils left over, uh, which is what creates all the smoke. Listen up, all you people out there thinking that they're doing f- something funky to the tobacco. I mean, I'm I'm looking at it like you, the cap. Like, I can just see the smoke just pouring off of it. Yeah, mine um, too. So, it's interesting because uh, I lit up just before the show. I was running a little bit late today. Uh, we're doing store openings, so I'm busy, busy, busy. And, and my initial impressions were, boy, this seems like this might be a little bit of letdown. And you said, just wait. Just wait. Just, <laughs> just let it settle in. And I'll tell you, I got about four puffs in, and then, woo, we're off to the races. Uh, it's got tons of malty, rich, sweet character. It's got uh, spice underneath that. Interestingly enough, I think the sweetness in this cigar is actually muting the spice, which I'm shocked at. I think so, too. I get way more spice on the retrohale yeah. than on the palate. Way more spice on the retrohale. And the the uh, finish on this is actually surprisingly crisp and clean. Like, it, it doesn't have any kind of lingering... Uh, leather, like a, I know with you know a lot of Maduros, you can get that really heavy, heavy uh, leather, earth or cocoa yeah. post draw. It's got a really nice, quick finish, which is probably good when you're pairing this with beer. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll find out very shortly. Yeah, we will. But I I agree. And then it's just got a touch of spice, like from the wrapper and from the corojo. But you're right, the sweetness really kind of covers that up. It's got a lot of uh, I get a lot of chocolate from it, like mm. not not the uh, like the the kind of bitter dry cocoa like that baker's I'm used chocolate to. yeah uh it's more like just a, a rich dark chocolate mm-hmm. yeah like an 80 percent cacao kind of thing yeah it and, and like you said i think if you want the spice when i do a retrohale i'm definitely getting the spice now it's not overwhelming spice for sure but it but it is that nice sharp spicy note mm-hmm. that i that i like uh, and again what's nice is the spice doesn't linger either so i do a retrohale spice um, kind of goes away almost immediately, which is nice. Gets me ready for a, a taste or another draw. I'm digging it. This is a good buy. I'm glad you. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you picked these up. I'm. I'm. Yeah, me too. I can't wait to see how this evolves. I. I only wish I had more. That's that's my only. I only wish I had more. Yeah. Well. Well. Hopefully. I mean, I could see them doing a second production of this because uh, I think they sold out in a few days. I know they sold most of them the first night. I don't know how long until they actually sold out. Um, but I, I can see this being a real big hit. Well, we'll get to our um, beer pairings in just a moment here. I'm new, um, we've got a couple uh, sponsors. Uh, the first one, of course, is our show sponsor, Gurkha. And the second is uh, the Rocky Mountain Smokeout, which is the biggest cigar event in Canada. And that'll uh, play right after our Gurkha sponsor spot. So uh, please stay tuned and we'll be right back. Brought to you by Gurkha Cigars. Gurkha Cigars, makers of the world's finest cigars. Try the 93 rated Heritage featuring a Rosado Ecuadorian Habano wrapper, Nicaraguan binder, and Dominican, Pennsylvanian, and Nicaraguan fillers. Blended by Gurkha's blending team at American Caribbean Cigars, it is hand rolled Nicaragua and available in 35 count boxes. Talk to your local BM about the Heritage today, or talk to them about other fine Gurkha cigars. Whatever your taste preference is, Gurkha has a cigar that's right for you.
we're back. This is Sharing Our Pairings, episode 118, Camacho, Cigar Dojo Imperial Stout Barrel Aged. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon, joined as always with Drippy Trent. So, it's beer time. I'm uh, I'm super excited. Sure it's going to be it's, it's going to be a long show. Uh we've got uh, a number of big beers, so if you uh, want to talk, uh, you want to participate in some shenanigan uh mcgregor mayweather talk we're going to be having an after dark segment so please stay tuned and stick around for that that'll be right after the regular show tonight but uh first beer i got going on tonight is from hoin brewing and this is the voltage espresso stout i don't know why i wanted an espresso stout but i, th- I thought you know sometimes espresso and an espresso stout and a, a um and a cigar can go really, really well, you know, like the espresso yeah. maybe doesn't work necessarily for the beer, but it does a great job of accenting the, uh, the, the beverage, the, the cigar, pardon me. A um, little bit about Hoyne Brewing. Opened in 1989. So BC has this sort of history of, of really being at the forefront of craft brewing within Canada. Uh, they located, they were originally located in the Swans Hotel in Victoria, BC, started by Sean Hoyne and Frank Appleton. And then they opened the Canoe Brew Pub in 1998. And uh, Sean is the brewmaster for the, uh, for the company. Surprisingly, it's only 5.6% ABV. Um, and their little blurb is that, uh, you know, when they were talking about what the inspiration for this beer was, they said, uh, let's make a beer with shocking polarity, black on black. And, uh, he said, Tommy D is always the conductor, kept them grounded with a three-pronged wisdom of uh, like love. Uh, like love, it starts with a spark, and when the field is fully charged, flip the switch, voltage. That's a little spiel. And uh, I didn't find the ingredients on the website. Curiously, they're on the beer, so that's kind of cool. Filtered water, filtered water, malted barley, choice hops, yeast, bows and arrows, specialty roasted espresso. The color is dark, the malty is roasted, and uh, the coffee is kind of in the middle, they say. I'm going to hold this up. It's kind of got a cool uh, cool bottle. I, I dig it. And uh, hold that up, kind of show that color. It's definitely stoutish. You know, it's not super viscous like uh, some of the other beers we've got tonight, but it's exactly what I would think out of a stout. It's got that nice black color, a little bit of a head on it. Definitely get the espresso out of the nose. I'm going to take some sippies and let you talk about your first beer. So my first one is uh, from Base Camp Brewing. Uh, they're they're based in Portland, Oregon, right where I am. Uh, they've got a brew pub in kind of downtown southeast Portland. They found, they were founded in 2012. Uh, they kind of got famous with these really interesting 22 ounce aluminum bottles. Uh, like if you've ever cool. seen those those kind of aluminum Bud Light bottles that they sell at like. I guess baseball games, Vegas, places where they don't need to break glass. Mm-hmm. Um, they came out with kind of 22 ounce versions of that for all their beers. And their whole thing was uh, that it was a beer for like camping and hiking and stuff like that. Um, so their, their motto is soak it in a mountain river, chill it in the snow or cool it off in a lake. Refrigerate it if you have to. Um, meaning cool the beer off anywhere but the refrigerator in the in the beautiful outdoors um they they have a very interesting uh history in the last couple of years their founder and owner uh was i think it was in may of last year he he uh called the cops seven times 911 um because there were homeless people outside his house awkward and, and after the first time uh, they told him, this is the non-emergency number. This isn't an emergency. And he kept calling. And then they came to the house. And he came out with an illegal rifle. Uh, and uh, ended up getting into a whole bunch of trouble. I but think. onto the beer. This is their s'more stout. Um, interestingly, it's called s'more because you will want some more. Not because it has chocolate or marshmallow in it. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is that's kind of weird to me. Usually, when you call something a beer, something like that, it's because it has those ingredients in it. Uh-huh. But you know, whatever. Um, so the way that they describe it is aromas of chocolate, coffee, fig, and smoke invite you into a gigantic maltiness that is distinct in its smooth and refined character, with flavors of chocolate and hints of smoke mingling with rich caramel, fruit, and warming alcohol. We like to top it off with roasted marshmallow. So you have the ultimate s'more experience. Uh, little little kind of, you know, feathery, flowery writing. Um, 
But it's a uh, 7.2% ABV stout uh, with 66 IBUs. Um, and I'm going to take a couple sips while you talk about yours. Copy that. So interestingly enough, this is probably one of the first times that I've ever had a stout be run over by a cigar. Um, and I think that speaks volumes uh, to the, to the I don't want to say full-bodiedness, but just the, the range of complexity that's on the cigar, the fact that it can run a stout over. Mm-hmm. So, so at 5.6%, I think the stout is very, very approachable. I think this is pretty much what I would classify as a sessionable stout. I mean, it's, it's not really that far off from... Uh, you know, what you classify as a porter to my mind. I was expecting the espresso to be really, really strong, but instead it's actually balanced. Uh, some of the notes I was reading, they said the espresso really ran over the beer. I'm not getting that at all. Uh, to me, this is really as, as espressoed as you'd want on a beer that's 5.6% ABV because otherwise I think the espresso would just take over and all you'd taste is coffee. And I've I've had that in stouts and porters where I think that's the risk of a coffee porter or a coffee stout is it, it becomes more coffee than beer. And unlike uh, perhaps a uh, pumpkin beer where I really want that pumpkin to be at the forefront, with a coffee stout or a coffee porter, you got to be really careful. I think you really don't want that coffee being the, the number one flavor. It should be in there for sure, but you don't want it taking over. Mm-hmm. So what ends up happening here is I get a lot of sweetness and mal- like that toasted malty co- quality off of the beer. This cigar just runs that right over. And I, I think what it does do is it takes some of the sweetness out of the, the cigar for me. Uh, it does accent a little bit of toasted earth, which I wasn't getting at all because I think that the sweetness on sweetness is canceling each other out. Uh, I, I still get the spices and the spices are maybe accented a little bit, but really what that brings out of the cigar is the uh, is that toasted earth. So I'm going to take a couple more puffs and a couple more sips and maybe you can talk about your pasting experience. Uh, so so the, the s'more stout, which I forgot to show you the color. It's kind of uh, just a little more viscous and dark than a porter, I would say. It's it's not quite black. Um, I think the hoppiness of this beer is a little much for the cigar. Um, it's not that it's super hoppy. It's more that it's not as balanced as most stouts are. It's not quite as sweet as a lot of stouts. Um, it's really more of the like kind of smoky, dark chocolatey kind of stout. And I I feel like the dark chocolate flavors really cover up the dark chocolate flavors from the cigar. But they it does bring out a little bit more spice on the palate, which I like. Hmm. Now, I am definitely getting still what I, I mean, really what I would describe as like a like a barrel aged flavor, like obviously a booze. I don't know if it's beer. I don't know if it's bourbon. But I'm definitely getting that barrel aged alcohol flavor off of the tobacco. And I think that's important because if you're going to bother to barrel aged tobacco, you really want to impart some of that to the cigar. You don't want to impart all of it. You don't want to overpower the cigar. But if you've barrel aged your tobacco and I can't taste that, then what's the point of barrel aging the tobacco really? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the feeling that I had when I thought of barrel aging tobacco is that there wouldn't be enough influence, but I feel like this one kind of strikes the right balance. I mean, I think it would be really easy to overpower the cigar and all you're tasting is like a, for lack of a better expression, just an alcohol, oaky alcohol uh, flavor on the tobacco. And it just takes the entire profile over, but that's not, that's not it at all. Like you said, it's balanced. It's good. I don't, unfortunately, I don't think this first pairing is really doing much for the cigar, which is a bit of a shame. I was kind of hoping that this is going to be one of the sweet spots. Uh, I did kind of shake it up with the three different beers I've got today. Um, I've, I kind of went mild, big, and bigger. So, um, yeah, I'm probably ready to move on to my second pairing. Yeah, me too. I, I went with about the same as you. I kind of went with, uh, I mean, I'll get on to the to this other beers in a few minutes. But I kind of went with what I consider the three kind of staple styles of a stout, which is a regular stout, a coffee stout, and a barrel-aged stout. Now, I just wish I had some barrel-aged 1050, and I'd be set. But, spoiler alert, I don't have any barrel-aged 1050. So I'm going to move on to my second stout, and it's a big one. It's actually bigger than the 1050. This is the Imperial Icarus Stout, and I'm surprised that I have not paired this stout on the show before and in addition i'm embarrassed to say i haven't impaired anything from this brewery on the show before either which is surprising because i love this brewery this is blind man brewing uh i'll hold the beer up here so everyone can see 
it's it's she she a thick dark stout. I mean, oh, it yeah. is it is dark and and thick, and viscousy. Uh, a little bit of a blind man brewing. They're located in Lacombe, Alberta. Lacombe, Lacombe is a little small town, smallish by Alberta standards. Uh, only started in 2015. Um, their mission statement is they want to be creating innovative, quality, and flavorful craft beer. That's a pretty simple. Uh, mission statement they want to use the best ingredients using local ingredients and they want to support the places they live in and the people that live there so you know that's a pretty standard mission statement i'd say for a lot of craft breweries you know they want to keep it local they want to keep it uh local ingredients fresh ingredients that's i i support that that's i'm totally on board for that quite a number of founders um founded by adam campbell uh, hans dolf shane uh grondal Dave Vonderplot, Matt Wollerton, and Kirk Zembel. So quite a number of founders there. Uh, a little bit about the Icarus Imperial Stout. Uh, and I love that they got the specs. They're obviously beer geeks. So it's uh, 1.1 original gravity, uh, 1.024 final gravity, 11% ABV, woo, and 80 IBUs with wow. uh, 46 SRMs. So uh, it's, I mean, it could be darker. Possibly, but that's a lot of IBUs, and I'm assuming you know they felt that the the ABV can handle that. So we'll we'll see how it pairs. They say it's a big high gravity stout with bold roasted malt character, and that's kind of what I'm looking for with an imperial stout. I want bold roasted malt. So I'll uh oh man, just malts for days. It's like I'm in a it's, it's like I'm in a in a vat. Crazy. Anyways, I'm gonna take some sippies here, and uh, you can quickly talk about your first beer. Yeah, so so Rob just uh, started watching and says that I look like I should be a uh, bassist in a metal band. Nice. And he's got really good timing because I'm about to drink, I think, one of his – I think it's like his – I think he said it's his favorite stout. Uh, so this is City of the Dead from Modern Times Brewing. Uh, and I've I featured it on the show at least once, maybe twice, because uh, it's also one of my favorite uh, stouts. Uh, it. It, it's hands down my favorite coffee stout. So, well, let me talk about Modern Times a little bit first. They're a fairly small brewery based in San Diego. And until about, I think about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, they were only distributed within like 50 miles of San Diego. Um, and a couple of years, I think about a year and a half ago, they started distributing more to Northern California. And then uh, last summer, they came to Oregon and Washington and uh, apparently Arizona, which seems like, uh, huh. I, I guess maybe Arizona is closer to San Diego than we are. So I guess that makes sense. Um, but they were actually founded by Jacob McKean in 2013, and he was an employee of Stone Brewing before. Oh. Uh, which obviously has a, uh, a very deep history in, in craft brewing in San Diego. Um, but this is City of the Dead. It's 7.5% ABV, 75 ABUs. And uh, the, the thing that makes this beer interesting, it's 75 ABUs. It only uses hop extract. There's no hops in this. Wow. Uh, the malt bill is crazy. It's like... A mile long. They're using two row dark chocolate malts, Munich pale chocolate malt, midnight wheat, flake barley, C170, and carapils. Uh, so they've got like everything from super dark roasted malts to light malts like carapils. Um, and the thing that makes it really interesting is that they house roast their own coffee, age it in bourbon barrels, and then add that to the coffee. So it's Kind of a, a coffee bourbon stout, but it's a little less uh, bourbon heavy uh, than like a barrel aged stout would be. Um, so I'm going to take a couple of sips of this now while you talk and about while, yours. And while you do that, uh, first of all, we'll play a little uh, spot from one of our sponsors. There we go. This show is sponsored by Cigar Oasis. Don't spend all your time worrying about your cigar wrappers cracking, splitting, or falling apart from humidity fluctuation issues. Set it and forget it by choosing Cigar Oasis, a professional solution which provides equal distribution of humidity with precise electronic controls. Monitor your cigars through the internet using the smart humidor Wi-Fi attachment. Why don't you spend all your time enjoying your cigars and relaxing and let Cigar Oasis protect your cigars. Cigar Oasis has solutions for any humidor. Make sure you set it and forget it today. This is Sharing Our Pairings, episode 118. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon, joined by Trippy Trent. 
We are pairing cigars and beers tonight. This is the Camacho Imperial Stout Barrel Aged. It's really good. It's really, really good. I'm really, really enjoying this cigar. Uh, this might be the favorite of mine of the Barrel Aged series. And it didn't start out that way. It took me a couple puffs to get into it, but I'm super digging it now. Yeah, um, I I really like this cigar. It's It takes the Triple Maduro, which is already a really good cigar, kind of to the next level by yeah. adding just a lot of extra complexity to it. I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, the Camacho Triple Maduro has a lot of body, but I don't think it has a lot of complexity. I love the Camacho Triple Maduro. I think I still have some of the original Camacho Triple Maduros in my Oh, cabinet. man. But yeah, I think it lacks a little bit of a little bit of complexity, and I think that comes through on this uh, in spades. Now, before we get into my um, pairing discussion here, uh, how are we doing for uh, audience questions, comments, feedbacks, emojis? Uh, we've got a lot of comments. Uh, Rob con- confirmed that City of the Dead is in fact his favorite coffee stout. Um, nice. Bob Dog would like to know what we think of the power band, but before we talk about that. Did you notice that on the Nicaraguan barrel aged, the on the band it actually says that it uses the patented power band process? I did not actually. I um, uh, I, I failed at noticing that. I'm not even sure what the patented power band process is. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is. They don't give out any details, but it's. Uh, I'm actually. I don't think it's actually patented, but yeah. it's. Uh, it's their own bunching process that they say adds more flavor and strength to the blend, which I, I everybody don't, says that. I, don't I mean, good for you. How but... that could, uh, how how I don't understand what it could be that makes it so special. Fan antubar antubato semi fan semi fan antubato. There's there's a lot of different ways to roll a cigar. Yeah. Everyone's got their own special technique. It's cool that they call those the power band. It's kind of a unique brand. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've only actually had one power band, Bob. Uh, I recall liking it, but not being totally wowed by it. I felt like it was kind of just standard Camacho fare. Have you smoked? Smoke- no, I don't think I have. I mean, I've like I said, I was going to say uh, I've smoked uh, more than a few boxes of Camacho Connecticut, which I'm actually super dig. I love the Corojo. Mm-hmm. I, I I think there's something to be said about Honduran Corojo because it's way different than Nicaraguan Corojo. Yeah. Um, maybe just because for me, it's a little bit of a cleaner spice. Uh, Nicaraguan Corojo is delicious, but it brings a lot of other flavors with it. So uh, when I smoke a Camacho Corojo, it's, it's a different experience. And of course, like I said, I mean, Triple Maduro was really... Probably one of the first cigars that I got into in the in the deep end of the full bodied spectrum, mm-hmm. and I still love them today. I mean, they're they're beastly, and you know that's really the cigar I would say if you if you think you're a big boy, if you want to step into the deep end, that's one of the cigars to do it with. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a uh, it's a nice strong cigar. It is like we were talking about before, kind of a little uh, one note ish. It's not super complex, but it's got tons and tons of flavor. Mm-hmm. so um you were mentioning with your first pairing oh and do we have any other comments or questions that we need to respond uh, to uh jason savka says a little off topic but why is it that some people can't retrohale i don't know uh when i was in high school i smoked cigarettes and i learned a french inhale which is where you kind of like mm-hmm. retrohale and then breathe it in um and i mean i was like 16 when that happened so Retrohaling has always been natural for me. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's one of those things It just, it takes you a while to get. And I think once you get it, you're like, oh, this is really easy. But there's just, there's a, there's a mental barrier. I've tried yeah. explaining it. Uh, the best way I had explained to me is to, to take the smoke in your mouth, close your mouth and you almost swallow. But instead of swallowing, you, you push it through your nose. So you're essentially pushing it to the back of your throat and pushing out your nose without inhaling. And it, to me, it's a swallowing process. That's how that I equate sense. it. But it takes practice. And, you know, the best way to practice it is by taking small puffs, not big puffs. Because if you screw up and you inhale, that's bad times. But, yeah. you know, we've preached in our reviews, we've preached on our shows. If you're not retrohaling a cigar, you're probably losing 80 or 85% of the flavor mm-hmm. complexity that's in a cigar. And you're doing yourself a disservice because you're paying sometimes 8, 9, 10. In this case, you could be ten, paying... 10 bucks for a cigar. If you're not retrohaling, you're missing out a lot. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 
And he so says, back to the pair. He says, John knows who I'm talking about. Yeah, he does. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, he does. Uh, so anyways, going back to my uh, beer pairing. So I'm, I'm having, I think, a similar experience with the Icarus Imperial Stout that you were having with your first beer. <clears throat> 80 IBUs is huge. Yeah. And I totally get on a big bold in your face imperial stout why you got to throw ibus in there because i think if you didn't it almost the multi the toasted malts would probably be overpowering like it'd just be so sweet and so yeah. strong and so sickly malty it'd be too much the problem is that when you're pairing with this particular cigars the the ibus that bitterness from the ibu that it, it lingers the hoppiness lingers yeah that's exactly the problem yeah. i had with the first one that i forgot to mention is that it was the it was the really hoppy finish that kind of uh took away from the cigar a lot mm. and it is i mean it it adds um it just interacts in a way with the cigar that gives it a funk that i just don't like and i don't know how to describe it other than to say that the bitterness from the hoppiness interacts on the cigar in an in an unpleasant way, and I think if it wasn't for that I, the the hoppiness, I think this would be a great pairing because um, it is a big bold stout. It is super roasty, super toasty. It's delicious, and it's good up until the point where I get to the finish, and then I take a puff of the cigar and I get that funky hoppiness, and it's just it's not the right pairing for the cigar. I think you need something with a lower IBU to go with this this particular Camacho. So interestingly, the City of the Dead has is higher IBUs than my first beer. The first one was 66, and this one is 75. Uh, this one does not have at all a bitter hoppy finish. It's got a sweet, chocolatey, um, kind of roasty finish with a little bit, a tiny bit of bourbon and a little bit of that c- coffee bitterness um, that doesn't linger on the palate at all. And I find it a much more pleasant pairing. Uh, with the cigar than the the s'more stout. Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a retro hail here because again, <clears throat> like I love this central taste of the imperial stout. Like that multi character is so good, but then I get to the finish, and then I take a puff, and it's just no bueno. Yeah, I find the even though the beer is really sweet, the fact that it's not it doesn't have that hoppy lingering finish makes it really bring out the sweetness of the cigar, uh, which, of course, mm. this cigar is all Maduro. It's got a ton of sweetness. Mm. Um, and I feel like the first beer was kind of covering that up a little bit. So I'm kind of getting into the uh, middle third here. And whoo, doggy! The spice is in the retro hill now. Oh, I was yeah. saying the, I was saying in the first punishing. third. I would, I would describe it yeah. as punishing. In the first third, I was like, you know, it's got some spice, you know, no big deal, NBG, NBD. Uh, now the spices are monstrous. I mean, this, it's like, this cigar is really evolving. The, uh, the retrohale in this, in the, as you get into the middle third here, is not a cigar you want to retrohale every draw, probably not every other draw. It's, it's big. I mean, like I took a retrohale, it's been about 30 or 40 seconds and I'm still like, my eyes are almost watering. It's so big on spice, which, you know, I like spice and I do. Yeah, it's, it's almost nice. like a, a wasabi level spice mm. on the retro hail at this point. That's a great way to put it. It's big. Yeah, it's big. I mean, it's nice because it does finish even the retro hail. It does finish with that that barrel aged sweetness, which I really really dig. And that's got that, like you said, that chocolate, that the high uh, cacao chocolate. Mm-hmm. I mean, frankly, this cigar is great without pairing. You don't really need to pair this cigar. It's it's kind of got the whole beer experience yeah, it, in the cigar. It's, yeah, it's got the pairing built in. Oh. oh, great beer, but man, not a good pairing. That that hoppiness is not a good thing. So <clears throat> I'm going to move on to my third and last pairing, which, I mean, this is kind of the pairing that I'm assuming is going to be the pairing of the night for me. Got to go with that 1050, son. And, uh, you know, I'm not really going to talk about Oscar Blues because at this point, Oscar Blues might as well be a sponsor of the show. Yeah. We talk about them every other week. Uh, they're in Colorado. They're awesome. Buy their products. All of them are awesome. Drink Oscar Blues. There you go. Um, so this is the 1050 Imperial Stout. Pours like motor oil. It's a, it's a, it's blacker than my soul. Um, I mean, even, even the head on that is black. It's not even white. You know, you don't even get that white foam on it. Yeah, it's dark brown. 
It's dark brown. So they say this titanic, immensely viscous stout is loaded with in, in, inimitable flavors of chocolate-covered caramel and coffee and hides a hefty 98 IBUs? No, that can't be right. That was 65. I would believe that. So the, the uh, barrel-aged version says 75. Well, that's weird because I thought it said 65. I have 65 down, but in the description they said 98. So this could be disappointing for me. At any rate, it's 10.5%. And by the way, uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, it is like today marks the hottest uh, temperature on record in the entire history of keeping temperatures for Calgary. It's like 92 degrees right now, which, I mean, this is the end of August and we like hot weather. Wait, I am... it's like it's never hit 100 there? In, in in the late August? Oh, no. oh okay. For the day, yeah, this, you mean. Okay, I yeah, thought yeah. you meant like the highest temperature it's ever been. No, 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 no. This late in August, I mean, half the time it's raining, half the time there's snow on the ground, half the time it's like 65 degrees. It's, well, I mean, we're lucky to hit the, uh, the high 70s this late in August, and usually by September it starts cooling off immediately. So I think we're in for a very hot and very humid September. And of course, you can't see the entire sky is just covered in uh, ash and smoke from all the mm-hmm. uh, wildfires in BC. Every morning, my car is covered in ash fall from the from the, and this is like this is like a thousand kilometers, like six hundred and fifty miles away, and there's ash falling on my car. That's how intense these forest fires are. Anyways, no one needed to know that. I just thought I'd share that because like I'm just I'm soaked. There's there's a picture for you. So um. They say it's made with an enormous amount of two-row malt, chocolate malt, roasted barley, flaked oats, and hops. It is the ultimate celebration of dark malts and boundary-stretching beer. And I love it. I mean, I think it's one of the few beers that I've ever given a 5.0 rating on Untapped. And if you want to follow me on Untapped, Cigar Surgeon. Shocker. Untapped. Um, so I, I, I don't have a lot of talking to do here because I'm drinking the barrel-aged version of exactly the same thing. Nice. Um. It's interesting that on the website they call it 75 IBUs. I'm wondering if it says somewhere on the can, but it doesn't. Yeah, my can doesn't say either, so I'm, I'm really weird because the specs I had was 60, 65. It doesn't taste like 98. I think that description is wrong. There's no way this it's is 98 It's possible. Um, so this is the same Ken Fitty in a can that's as tall as my head. Because um, what you need is more Ken Fitty. Yeah, yeah, what I mean, you need it's not is enough, ni- right? 19.2 ounces of 10 fitty and because of the barrel aging this 10 fitty picks up a little bit of extra alcohol and clocks in at 12.9 percent abv um i mean it might as well be a port at that point yeah it's it's aged in bourbon barrels of course for one year and as i said before it's it's bourbon barrels from a range of different distilleries and of course um the beer that i'm drinking was in the same barrel as this cigar that i'm smoking which is kind of cool we're going to talk about the uh, pairing in just a moment. I can tell you right now, it's good. But we're going to have a word from one of our sponsors first. Show brought to you by Drew Estate. Until June 30th, if you're a Drew Diplomat member, you attend a rewards program event and make a promotional purchase, you will receive a Liga Privada Velvet Rat. You'll also be entered to win a Drew Diplomat Pewter Ashtray, Mega Standing Ashtray, or the Swag Closet Human, or dubbed the Divorcinator. All these products were built and designed by Drew Estate Subculture Studios. If you're not a member, download the Drew Diplomat app from the Apple Store or Google Play Store today. Drew Estate, she good. She good. So, um, it's interesting because, uh, I mean, even if it is 65 IBUs, which I think it is, um, it's a remarkable transition from the Icarus Imperial Stout to the 1050. The 1050 absolutely has almost cloyingly intense malts yeah that are like crazy roasted but boy oh boy does it go well with this cigar like it's just i take a sip of the 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 10 fitty and then i take a draw of the cigar and it just supercharges every single element that's in this cigar yeah i'm a, i'm having the, exactly the same experience uh, the only difference is mine has a little bit more of the uh kind of the sweet notes you get, the vanilla that you get from from barrel aging, uh, but man, this is a a great pairing. They were it's almost like they were made to go together. It's almost like they were made to go together. Yeah, no, this is um, I mean, I'd say this is damn near a perfect pairing. Actually, 
Um, now I'm getting a little bit of that hoppiness, but I think what's nice is there's so much, so much malty character in this that the they're balanced. So you don't like, I can taste the hops, but in equal proportions of the post draw post sip malts. So I don't get an intense bitterness. Um, and that's good because like, as we were discussed, the bitterness and the cigar is just not a good combination. Um, I'm getting tons of chocolate off the, the cigar now. Interestingly enough, on the retro hail, and I don't know if it's because of the pairing or just because this, the the cigars kind of evolved, but that intense, crazy, overpowering spice has really dropped off in the retro. Yeah, so it's kind of back to where it was in the first third for me. Yeah, um, and ab- about the bitterness, I'm going to get a little beer geeky. Um, so the difference in the bitterness is because of when the hops are added. So the earlier in the process the hops are added, the longer they have to release those. Uh, alpha acids which are what makes it super bitter um and so if you add a little bit of hops at the beginning at at the very very beginning you end up with more bitterness than if you add like twice as much hops at the end of the boil um so you can get the same ibus without having the same amount of bitterness so i think that these are more these have more of a uh like a later hop addition so you end up with the same IBUs, but less of that kind of palate wrecking bitterness. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes with the, um, the big Imperial IPAs, you'll see that they even dry hop, um, Mm -hmm. just to, just to get that really, really intense, uh, IPA hoppy flavor. Um, here, like, like you said, whatever process they use, they do a great job of, of, Really, in my mind, what the what the hoppiness is supposed to do, which is balance out that malt, and I yeah. think it does it very well. And it still um, has a really kind of clean finish as far yeah. as the hops part goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's balanced nicely. Um, interestingly enough, I think I get more of the coffee on the uh, 1050 Imperial Stout than I do off of the um, off of the Voltage Espresso Stout. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and, and that's just a result of the. Like the the combination of the bitterness and the roasty malts, like chocolate malts and stuff like that, end up kind of mimicking the flavors of coffee. It's good, man. This is, I mean, this is a this is a fantastic pairing. I'm really digging yeah. this. Yeah, I'm excited to give this this pairing a score. <laughs> yeah, me too. So, uh, getting into tomorrow, um, we've got a pretty exciting show tomorrow. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm I'm really excited for it. We've got the guys from Handrolled. Um, if you're not familiar with it, Handrolled is a documentary they're creating um, that is focused on the cigar industry, premium cigars. So they started off going around interviewing people, and uh, we'll talk about it, of course, more tomorrow night, how it happened. Uh, but kind of as they created the project, the scope got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so now they've all, I think they've already been to Nicaragua and, uh, I know they did a bunch of interviews in, uh, in California. They posted pictures of them interviewing Pete there, Daniel Marshall, um, Cigar Vixen was part of it. And they just posted a video today on Facebook. They're going to Connecticut and the Dominican Republic and Cuba within the next few months. And they're wrapping up production. Now, did they talk to you at all about being on camera? No. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Eh, <laughs> we're not as pretty as Delicia. Yeah. She is very pretty and very knowledgeable. And uh, she's built quite a brand for herself. So, you know, she looks a lot yeah. better on camera than we do. No question. Exactly. There's a reason where uh, we have more listeners on the radio. That's right. Faces for radio, <laughs> not for live video. So that'll be tomorrow night. And as I understand, there's some sweet oh, swag giveaways. Yes, I forgot to mention they they have graciously offered up a uh, a t shirt and a lighter for sacrifice. The lighters are really cool. They're um I'm not sure if they're Zippo brand. They're there's they look kind of like a Zippo. Um they say hand rolled on them and they've got a torch inside rather than and, a soft flame. And really, I think the uh, we're, we're going to go based on sort of what they think the best question is. We might overrule them and, and choose a different question that we think is better. But you got to get your, if you want to get your weasel on, you got to get some good questions in. And I don't want, you know, these boring, typical questions that get asked. We want some really good, hard-hitting questions that, yeah. that provide a good response. And really, I think what we're looking for is, any kind of question that gets them, you know, talking like a JD length. So like if they respond, it takes <laughs> them five minutes to respond to that question. 
that's going to put you in the uh, running for, yeah, uh, you, for Weezer. Yeah, you might get yourself a lighter. So that'll be tomorrow night at a regular scheduled time of 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. Of course, 6 p.m. Mountain, the only time that matters, really. Uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. And, uh, yeah, get your questions. So, so we'll uh, we'll quickly go over uh, kind of how the pairing went. It, it It's kind of up and down. I'm, I don't yeah, actually know that we've... it's been a roller yeah. coaster. I don't know that we've had a show in a very long time that have had as many pairs kind of miss, um, which, you know, sometimes that's exciting for pairings to miss. But first up, I had the uh, Voltage Espresso Stout from Hoyn Brewing. This is a really, really nice espresso stout. Uh, it's sessionable at 5.6%, at least for us uh, beer heads that, you know, like drinking all the time. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's just not big enough. Uh, if you're going to pair a beer with this uh, Camacho Imperial Stout Barrel Aged, you need a bigger beer. I'd say, really, you shouldn't be looking at anything less than 9% ABV. Um, so sadly for me, I think that first pairing, probably probably an 84, 85, kind of a bit of a miss for me. How about you? Uh, yeah, my first one was just a miss. It was too bitter, and it really took away from the experience of the cigar. I would rate that one in 85 Moving on to the second pairing of the night from Blind Man Brewing, which uh, I love their beers. I, again, I don't know how I haven't paired more of their stuff on the show. This is the Imperial Icarus Stout. It's big, it's bad. It's even bigger and badder than the 1050. Uh, unfortunately, because the IBUs are a little bit higher, uh, that that bitterness carries through in the post-taste and really does not go well with a cigar. The central flavors of the beer are fantastic and I think would go really well with the, the cigar, but unfortunately that bitterness really, really takes away from the cigar experience. And uh, this is probably one of the first pairings that really kind of ranks in that 80-81 rank. Um, the beer Ooh. itself is like in the 90s for me, but as a pairing, uh, this is, yeah, 80-81. It's just, it's not a good pairing at all. Ouch. That's that's a low number. Mm -hmm. um, so the City of the Dead is a beer that I adore. Um, it was a good pairing, but not a great pairing. I would give this one a 90. It was, it was very good. Um, I, it might have gotten a couple more points if I hadn't had the 1050 after it. Yeah. So moving on to the 1050, the beer by which all Imperial Stouts are, are judged and sometimes found lacking. Um, I mean, first of all, it's it's kind of unfair because the 1050 really is, to me, a 5 out of 5 Imperial Stout. It's It's kind of got everything for an Imperial Stout. I mean... I do like Russian Imperial Stouts as well, so I think it's a different category that could be could be scored. So you're already dealing with a stout that's a 5 out of 5. You're dealing with a cigar that was really, in essence, blended and aged to kind of go with 1050 to begin with, so it's a little unfair, but we had to pick a 1050. We had to pick something yeah. from Oscar Blues to go with it. And to me, at, at the risk of being a homer, I'd say this is really a perfect pairing. I, I don't know... I don't know how a beer could go any better complimentary with his cigar than that 1050 Imperial Stout. You could barrel age it. You could barrel age it. <laughs> I wouldn't know because uh, I'm up in Canada and, you know, we just don't get the same freedom beers that you guys do in the States. But uh, maybe one day I'll find out. Um, and, and my barrel age 1050, I mean, it's just an incredible pairing. I, uh, this one is mm -hmm. like 97, 98. It's it couldn't be more perfect. Um, so maybe it should even be higher, but I'm not comfortable giving a score that high. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was really, um, I was really struggling. I was like, you know, I feel like that takes my credibility away giving it a hundred. So maybe I should give it a 97, 98. But again, like from what I've tasted, from what I've paired going from that, that sort of scale to mm -hmm. me, this is a perfect pairing. If I had the barrel aged, maybe I'd go, okay, Maybe this is actually a 96, 97 with the barrel age. That's a 99, 100, but not having the barrel age, it's tough for me to have that reference point. Understandable. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's weird. Cause what I expected is having the 10 fitty with it would cover up the flavors of the cigar mm. because they're so similar, mm. but I find it really brings out more flavor. Like the, the cigar has, I don't know, 30% more flavor when I'm drinking the barrel age 1050 than when I'm drinking the other beers. And I think Barry Stein, our special guest from uh, Cigar Authority, has talked about that in the past, where sometimes having something that's really similar actually 
Uh, you wouldn't think that complimentary would necessarily super, because to me, sometimes I go for contrasting to, to really accent the cigar. Yeah. But in this case, it is it is so complimentary that it does, in fact, really hyper nuance and hyper uh, focus on some of those flavors within the cigar. And that that isn't always the case, but I think that's definitely the case in this particular pairing tonight. Yeah, it just brings out so much complexity in the cigar. So unfortunately, they are sold out. But keep your uh, keep your dirty weasel eyes peeled because, like Trippy said, um, this is just the first release. I'm sure, based on the fact that they sold out, uh, they'll probably be doing another release, hopefully soon. You want to get your dirty dirty weasel hands on those. Uh, make sure to get your questions in for uh, hand rolled tomorrow night. That'll be at our 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, regular time, live at cigarfederation.com, live on Facebook. And we will be back next week with our normal sharing our pairings. Uh, we'll have that show schedule up. We're working on getting our complete show schedule for the next couple of months. So you guys can kind of track that along. And thanks for everyone who's tuned in live. We'll be back in a few minutes to uh, do our After Dark segment. We've got quite a few things to talk about here. But for all our Armed Forces Radio Network people out there, thanks so much. Hope you've been entertained wherever you are in the world. Hope you're staying safe. I think this is, uh, this is Labor Day weekend for everybody, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So I hope everyone has a great Labor Day weekend, uh, does some camping, you know, does some barbecue, kind of enjoys the warm weather while it lasts, wherever you are, that the warm weather doesn't last, which is, you know, up here. And as we say on Sugar Pairings, drink better, but drink less. Tonight we are not drinking less. We are drinking no. better, but we are not drinking less. We're drinking very better. Yeah. Um, this this reminds well. me of the sh- show with Robbie when we had like uh, three... 9.5 plus percent uh, beers and things just got out of hand after like a half an hour. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I won't be finishing the 10 50 at the very yeah, least. Tonight. No kidding. Um, I mean, it's a huge beer in a giant can. Yeah. It's stupid. And, uh, it, should, last... it should come in one of those Coke mini cans. Really? Yeah, it really should. And also then there would be more of it for me to buy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The last time I had it, I woke up with a little, a little, headache in the morning yeah um after i mean i just had like two half glasses of scotch and that and it was too much it's a hangover in a can man uh, it's good though so before i i'm gonna first talk about the uh, rocky mountain smokeout because uh it's coming up in just short four weeks and we kind of spoiled some of the releases. So all the weasels out there who are tuning in, who are attending the Rocky Mountain Smokeout would have noticed some of the logos. And I'll talk about that in a second. But before I do, how are we doing for audience questions, comments, feedback? Uh, Jason Subka says he's going to be there tomorrow bringing the tough questions. Uh, he also says he loves uh, Blind Man Brewing. Yeah, they're so good. I've never had anything from them. I don't think it makes it down here. No, it's too small. Craft Brewing, it's really just Alberta-based right now. Yeah, that's... I mean, that that's how a lot of the beer around here is. Like, the uh, the mm-hmm. Base Camp Brewing, I, d- yeah. I don't think much of their stuff makes it out of the state, if any. I mean, it's tough, right? I mean, you really get, you got a huge marketplace wherever your, your brewery is located, and you have to get to some pretty high volume production to want to even think about exporting because there's a lot of complexity and cost that goes with exporting outside of wherever you are so um yeah i don't and, even know and there's a happen. there's a lot of beer consumption here yeah um, exactly i think the the last time i checked something like 40 percent of all packaged beer sold in the state is made in the state and over 50 percent of all beer on tap is made in wow. the state. Wow. That makes sense, though. That makes sense. You, I mean, the nice thing about having a beer on tap is you're getting it fresh, presumably straight from the brewery. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, to me, you know, fresh from the brewery on tap is the best way to experience a beer. Yeah. And we, we've got a couple, there are a couple of uh, breweries. I can't remember the name suddenly. Um, but there's a few breweries around here, which, of course, there are breweries like that everywhere that the only way you can get it is from the brewery. You can't get it anywhere else. So kind of alluded to, we've got um, 
really the biggest uh, cigar show, cigar event in Canada. Uh, this is our fourth annual show. We've been doing it for four years. It's a big, big show, especially by Canadian standards. Um, probably not that big compared to some of the bigger smokeouts and stuff in the States, but you have to understand taxes are high here. Uh, yeah. We're very, very spread out. It's very tough to get. Uh, first of all, it's very tough to get a number of different cigar vendors organized for an event like this. And it's really tough to get a number of people together on an event like this. And the toughest part of all is to find an event and find a location that you can smoke at. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, we've got a really great partner with the uh, Stony Nakoda, which is located on a First Nations Reserve. Uh, so fortunately for us, rules don't necessarily apply there, That <laughs> like they, which is great. I mean, perfect. that's it's perfect. You know, they say smoking goes, smoking goes. And the uh, provincial government can't say anything about it, which, you know, we dig that. So, uh, this is going to be a big, big show. Uh, if you followed the ad spot in the uh, first part of first segment of the show, you was, you saw that there's a lot of cigars being, um, being featured at this event. We've got, uh, quite a number of cigars from foundation, which has not really been around here in Canada. So I think there's a lot of people that are going to go a little bit bananas when they see the foundation product up here and get a chance to try it. Uh, of course, we've got, um, so Rob's tuning in, we've got Mombacho and, you know, oh, I, yeah. I, I mean, Mombacho has been on our shelves for quite some time. I think almost two years here, year and a half, two years. So I'm really excited to give that a wide presence here because I think there's a lot of smokers up here that are really going to like it. Uh, but we've also got uh, some Henry Clay, we've got some Rocky Patel, some CLE, um, We've got some uh, Espinosa, which I'm super excited about. Oh, We've got yeah. the, some some new Alec Bradley. Um, it's going to be a hell of a show, and we're going to have uh, more cigars and more boutique cigars than I think we've ever had ever at the show. One of the cool things is that the uh, brewmaster from uh, Banff Brewing is a huge cigar guy, and uh, he brings a special cask to the event every year, and. Uh, last year he brought a cask. It was this like, I don't know, it's like four year old stout, three year old stout. that's just kind of been sitting in his, in his, uh, chill room for forever. And, uh, we, we ate that up. We just drowned it in like, uh, maybe an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And he's, he's like, that's what he said. He's like, wow, I've, that's never happened before. I guess I'm going to have to tap a second cask. And we're like, I guess you're going to have to tap a second cask. And then we finished off the second cask uh, because we're just complete animals. Um, but it's, you know, we've got some really great high-end spirits. We've got some really great high-end cigars. Uh, it's it's a hell of a good time and you can smoke the entire time. So for Canadians uh, and anyone who wants to be crazy enough to travel up to Alberta at September 29th and 30th to experience it, it's really the cigar show uh, to attend every year. So um, that'll be a good time. That's coming up just in four weeks. So we're kind of in full planning mode to uh, finalize all that stuff. And that's what I've been busy with, along with uh, opening stores. Uh, Jason Sovg has a quick question about the, the Rocky Mountain smokeout. I'm sure he does. <clears throat> uh, is Rob actually going to be there? Well, so um, originally the, uh, the plan was to have our good, and I don't want to throw him under the bus. Cause it's not fair, but, um, we had, a, we had plans to have Claudio there, Claudio from Mabacho. Um, but Claudio is going to be celebrating the birth of his first child, a baby yeah, boy. Yeah, that, that jerk went and had a baby. Yeah. He had it, you know, his, he and his beautiful wife had to go and have a baby. I mean, what a selfish jerk. So understandably, uh, like a very wise married man, he will not be attending the uh, Rocky Mountain Smokeout, which is a shame because we're really looking forward to it. Uh, but I think perfectly understandable. Uh, so hopefully yeah, maybe absolutely. that's something we can arrange for our fifth annual Rocky Mountain Smokeout. The five-year celebration would probably be a good opportunity for us to have him up here. But um, that's a year away. So we're going to focus on this year and we'll figure out what uh, happens for next year. All right. And and Bob says he wants that new Mercy Lago from Espinosa. Mm. I'm, I'm kind of... um. Have you smoked it yet? Not yet. I'm really looking forward to it, though. I'm I'm really looking forward to it too. Uh, I love the bat. Uh, I love the new bat. I love the old that, bat. That new branding is so good too. It's tight. It's really tight. So it's the new old old bat. It's the original original bat. I'm super excited to try it. I'm kind of excited to try the new reggae's and the reggae dread. Mm-hmm. I love Espinosa as a rule of thumb. It's uh, kind of one of those few manufacturers out there where I can kind of just pick something blind from them and I know I'm going to like it. Yeah. If I know that something comes out of their factory, I'm kind of already biased because I kind of 
think I'm already going to like it anyways. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to try a bunch of the new releases. I, I mean, there's a bunch of new stuff that I'm, I'm I really not need to get to and haven't had a chance to yet. Yeah, me too. That's, I mean, that's, uh, as I've learned with my first IPCPR that that's kind of the curse of going to IPCPR is you end up with this, um, you immediately within one week end up with a backlog of so many cigars, so many cigars that you need to smoke and review and talk about and, it's not easy. Todos los dias, fin de los mundos. Um, shoot, I got the Boondog Saints, and you know I love Black Label Trading Company, yeah. and I haven't even smoked the Boondog Saints yet. Like it's... I, was, I was planning on reviewing it last week, um, but of course we didn't have a show on Thursday. I woke up Thursday with the cold that my wife and kids have been walking oh. around with for a couple weeks. Uh, I thought I was going to manage to keep it off, but... Um, no reviews for me this week because yeah. of that. If you can't, if you can't smell, you can't taste. Yeah, exactly. Um, so maybe, maybe this week I'll get to it. Anything can happen. So there was a very small, very intimate sporting event last uh, last week. Not really talked about. Not really carried. Not a lot of people talked about it. It's only the fight of the century. Yeah, it was. It was a very small. Uh, attraction that happened that uh, not many people cared about. You know, it's not like it was the largest pay-per-view event in pay-per-view history. The f- the total it brought you know, down servers. Brought down servers is like four hundred and twenty million, four hundred forty million, something like that payout. Just stupid. Um. So obviously you watched the fight. Obviously, yes. Um. And it, so what I heard is that you know how they played the. Assuming you watched it too, they played like the like 15 minute long video of them. Like, I don't know. It just showed them doing stuff like jibber jabbering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, apparently that wasn't originally part of the plan. Oh, they delayed the fight by 15 minutes because of all the pay-per-view issues. Oh, interesting. Because some people who were actually like, I was watching it online, um, on pay-per-view and I was having issues with it. And apparently some people who were actually like watching it on pay-per-view cable, like the feed just went out. Uh, and we they did, spent we, some time working on that. So we didn't have the feed go out, uh, before the fight. We actually had the feed go out for about maybe eight seconds during the fight. And oh, obviously man. there was a lot of screaming and yelling going on when that happened. Um, but it came back pretty quick, which is nice. Um, but I mean, it's tough to support. I mean, that's a big event, man. I mean, when you have an event that big, things break. That's just what happens. Yeah, I mean, as expected, it was the the biggest pay per view of all time. Mm-hmm. So I thought. So I'm going to start with the undercount under undercard fights because I think we're going to be in a bit of a discussion here. I've got a lot of cigar to left to go. Yeah. Undercard was decent. The uh, the IBF fight was a little disappointing because I thought, and I don't know his name. But the uh, former IBF champion oh, couldn't. Uh, who... uh, the British guy, right? No, 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 um, no, no, no. It was the um, he wasn't British. It's was no. the little dudes. <clears throat> it was the little dude, and, oh, and he oh, couldn't. Oh. He couldn't make weight. Yeah, he came in at 132 pounds, which you know. So there really, there's it's kind of two people that are watching the fight. There's MMA fans that are watching the fight, and there's boxing fans. And I feel like I kind of straddle, you know, I've kind of straddled both. I've been watching MMA since 92, since UFC number two. Uh, I dabble in boxing, but I'm not a box. I'm not like Coop. I'm not like Phil Zangi. I watch boxing, but I'm not dialed into the same level. But if you don't make your weight as a, as a uh, title holder in boxing, fuck out. it is embarrassing. I mean, there's a reason why they strip your title because it's, it's just a, it's just a complete embarrassment. And uh, his performance was embarrassing. His behavior was embarrassing. Um, I was really kind of hoping the guy from, uh, I think the guy from was from Croatia. Uh, no, no, no. No, he wasn't. He was from Costa Rica. The, uh, his opponent was from Costa Rica. And I was really hoping I was going to knock him out. Because I was like, you should knock this fool out. He's, he's clowning around the ring. He's, he's just making a spectacle of this fight. And I really hope you knock him out and take the uh, title. Unfortunately, he didn't. <clears throat> So the title remains vacant until the next fighter goes in. And I think yep. the the fighter who had the IBF title says he's going to go up to 135 pounds uh, and try the next title. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 
that was the uh i'm trying to remember their names but yeah that was a, that was a disappointing fight i mean yeah. the anytime somebody misses wait it's disappointing it's Terrible. just when you're when you're being paid that much and you have that much time to prepare there's no reason for it you um you should know not to bulk up too much you're a professional it's your job yeah. your job um i thought the cruiser rate fight was quite good um you know it was, it was there was a lot of action in every round mm-hmm. which was nice um and it's nice you know in boxing it's all about pacing and it's really tough especially the higher the weight class goes to see that kind of activity because you've got a 12 round fight. You need to pace yourself for 12 rounds. And those guys went all out and it was a very, yeah. very good lead up fight to the title fight. I thought. Yeah, I thought so too. That was, that one was the first one on the pay-per-view, right? The to be the third one. Tabidi Cunningham, Cunningham. No, that was the super flyweight. The first one. Yeah. Tabidi was, the, was the flyweight. I think. No, Tabidi's Tabidi's cruiserweight, 200 pounds. Oh. I thought that was the third fight of the night. No, that was the All first right. fight of the pay-per-view part. Okay. It was a good uh, fight. Yeah, that one was a really good fight. That one was going back and forth, and uh, it, there was just a lot of action in that fight, which is, you know, is always fun to see. I mean, I hate it. <laughs> Excuse me. I hate it when a fight goes all the way to the um, judges because I hate to see any fight in MMA or boxing go to the judges. Yeah. <clears throat> but that definitely looked like a fight that at any moment either opponent was going to was going to knock the other opponent out and that's mm-hmm. that makes for a very exciting fight. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. That was an exciting fight. So, that leads us naturally into Mayweather versus McGregor. So, maybe we'll just talk broad strokes, quick hits. What was your takeaways from that fight? Um, so it it didn't start the way I was expecting. Uh, I mean, it was kind of like uh, Mayweather rope doped him. <laughs> uh, he, I mean, McGregor came out way harder than I expected, and yeah. it seemed seemingly Mayweather like was confused and didn't know what to do. Uh, but by the beginning of the fourth round, it was obvious that it was part of Mayweather's game plan yeah. because McGregor was just getting gassed from throwing all those big shots. Yeah. And uh, then Mayweather just started putting it to work. And, man, that ref was so mad. I thought that ref was going to knock McGregor out. So um, I thought it was interesting that, uh, first of all, I thought there was a lot of strategy employed by Mayweather. And and I think Mm -hmm. for a lot of the MMA fans out there, two things you have to remember. One, Mayweather's been retired for two years. Two years. Two years is a lifetime in any sport. If you're retired from MMA or boxing for two years, that is that is an eternity. And that is a lot of rust to shake off. And it, it's it's not like a layoff, like an injury or something right. where you're still training. Yeah, he's it's completely retired. retired. He was like, I'm done. I'm going to sit at home and watch TV. And he's 40 years old. And whether it's NFL or boxing, a 40-year-old facing, a, what is McGregor, 27? 29. 29? 29. That's, uh, that is an enormous gulf of age difference. I mean, it's huge. Um, but it seemed like from the very start, Mayweather had a game plan. And I thought that initially when I saw him turn his back to McGregor, I was like, what is he doing? And it occurred to me very, very early on, and I don't know how many people caught this, but I'm pretty confident that Mayweather was trying to trick McGregor into DQing himself, which he frankly almost did. And I think the, he was um, really close a few times. I can't believe how many times he grabbed on. I mean, he hit him with like five or six hammer fists. He got five or six warnings in two rounds from the uh, from the ref. Um, I think that a normal situation, the ref should have deducted a point absolutely by the third hammer fist. I can't believe fist. he didn't deduct a point for grappling. He should have. He should have deducted a, gro- a point for grappling. He absolutely should have deducted a point from hammer fisting, and he should have de- deducted a point for Mayweather because Mayweather should not have been turning his back. And I yeah. absolutely believe that was a part of a strategy for Mayweather to get McGregor to DQ himself, and he almost did. There was several. There were several points where you, if if you go back and watch in the second round, where McGregor. Looks like he's about to foot sweep Mayweather. He stepped around him for for a bit of a foot sweep and then came to his senses and realized you can't do that. But it, it was a lot of the things that I was saying going into the fight is that if you're an MMA fighter, 
a lot of this stuff, especially for a guy as high caliber and high performance as McGregor, it's not conscious level action. It's subconscious level action. It's animal instinct. It's animal instinct. Because that's what you, when you're that high level, you have to be able to operate on animal instinct. Right. If you get rocked and you start getting confused, you're not going to win. Right. And he's able to, like, he's at that level where he can get hit with, I mean, a kick to the face and he can be out on his feet and still fight. Yeah. Because that's part of MMA. That's not part of boxing. That's not part of boxing. So, you could see several points where I think McGregor was trying to draw him into letting his instincts take over, which would have resulted in the DQ, which would have resulted in McGregor taking a huge hit to his purse. Mm. To McGregor's credit, he didn't do it. He, he almost got sucked in a few times. Um, but I think your assessment is right. I think that looking back, it's clear that Mayweather's Mayweather's goal was to get McGregor to come out and gas in the first three, four rounds, which he did. He threw everything he had. He was exhausted by the beginning of round five. Absolutely Um, beat. And and round four, he absolutely lost in my book. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, that's where things just started falling apart, and he started getting counterpunched all day. Now, I do want to say, I'm not a boxing judge, obviously, uh, but I would absolutely give the first two rounds to McGregor. I would give him the first three. Yeah, maybe even the first three. The first two, no question, were McGregor rounds, uh, both from uh, aggressiveness, number of punches thrown, number of punches landed. Um, Looking at the scorecard afterwards, they gave most of the rounds to Mayweather, and it's a boxing match. So, you know, I'm not a boxing judge. I can't can't intelligently overrule that. But as as a guy who's watched some boxing and a lot of MMA... I would not have given those first two rounds to Mayweather. But regardless, the moment where you started to get into the third and fourth round, it was very obvious that uh, Mayweather had turned the tide. And when you start to see some of the highlights in the third and fourth, and certainly the fifth round, almost all the punches that McGregor were throwing uh, were being parried or dodged or or ducked by, um, by Mayweather. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was like a... It was really weird to see him lose the first at least two rounds. Yeah. <clears throat> and then then he just started coming out of his shell and and going for it and <clears throat> for the next 5 rounds McGregor looked like he didn't even belong there, which he didn't. <laughs> well, I mean, what was funny <clears throat> for people who I mean, uh if you followed <clears throat> Mayweather's career Mayweather is a counterpuncher. Yeah. He's not a, he's not a, he's not an attack. Like that is his strategy. Counterpunches. And uh, a lot of people find counterpunching and boxing to be very boring, but it's a strategy. And sometimes it's a very effective strategy. Basically from halfway through the third round till the end of the fight, Mayweather basically walked him down yeah. for every single round, which is so strange for Mayweather and Mayweather was just absolutely pushing the fight to the point where McGregor was throwing punches and Mayweather was walking right into them because he didn't care. He wasn't scared. He yeah, wasn't he intimidated. Yeah, he was walking through the punches. Walking completely. through the punches. And yeah. McGregor's defense was really bad because mm-hmm. um, he started off with his fists up yes. and then by round three, his fists were like down here Yeah, and he wasn't even like, act- he wasn't passively blocking. He was only actively blocking. Well, which is the worst strategy you can have in boxing. Yeah, I mean, and again, you know, like no disrespect to McGregor as an MMA fighter. He's absolutely world, world class. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Being a world class MMA fighter is not the same as being a world class or competitive professional boxer. It's a completely different skill set. Boxing is a very specialized set of skills. Mm-hmm. And along with that, keeping your hands up. The ability to dodge, duck, parry, and block incoming shots, which, you know, like I said, if you go back and watch some of the highlights, and there's a lot of highlight videos out there now, we can watch the number of shots that McGregor threw in, and Mayweather basically parried with his elbow, parried with his boxing glove, and I think what happened was a lot of MMA fighters are watching this and like thinking McGregor is just pounding the hell out of Mayweather. When you go back and look at it, you realize these punches are not landing. They're not yeah. hitting him. They're hitting his glove. They're hitting his arm. They're hitting his shoulder. They're hitting his elbow. He's not getting hit by these punches. And that's what an effective professional boxer does is he, is he can he can not take that punishment until you start to get tired, until your defense starts to get whittled down. And that's professional boxing 
frankly, at that level, really doesn't get started till the sixth round because, you know, the first four or five rounds is them feeling each other out, unless you're Mike Tyson. Yeah, and I think part of Mayweather's strategy, besides, um, like I said on Facebook, that he was – he wa- part of the reason that he did those first four rounds the way he did is because he wanted to put on a show. Yes. Uh, and part of it was because the fight wasn't official until round five. Mm-hmm. Unless it made it into round five, it wouldn't have been the 50th win on his record. Well, and I, and I think a part of that is if you are a – guy with uh, that many fights under your belt that much fight experience you recognize that you don't need to go out and finish a fight in two rounds yeah you don't need a flash knockout anymore you don't need a flash knockout because quite frankly going for a flash knockout opens you up for the potential of getting knocked out yourself he knew that if he could get a sense of what the the fight style was going to be understand his opponent in the first couple rounds and once he did that he realized he had his opponent because he had a, he had him figured out, and that's what Mayweather did, which is what really experienced boxers do. You know, they don't try and go for that flash knockout. They try and figure you out as a boxer, and then from that point on, it was clear that the rest of the fight was Mayweather taking it to McGregor, and McGregor gassed out and was taking a hell of a punishment. And uh, frankly, I thought the ref stoppage was on point because um, you know I literally yeah, saw him were, go against the ropes, and there was, was like, a this lot is done. of complaining about the the ref stoppage and it was absolutely fine. I mean, uh, there was almost two minutes left of that round. Mayweather was going down either way. McGregor. Uh, Yeah. Or yeah, sorry. McGregor was going down either way. Um, he was not defending himself anymore, which is like the number one thing of boxing that they don't care about quite as much in MMA. Um, you can take a couple shots without defending yourself and they're okay with it. But in boxing, once you stop defending punches, you've lost the fight. Yep. And that's exactly what he did. And and I think additionally, the difference between MMA and boxing is that when you fight a professional boxer and you're not defending yourself, he's not just going to knock you out. He's actually going to cause you long-term mental, probably brain damage. Yeah. If he comes in and you're not defending and he hits you with enough punches and enough combos, you're going to have brain damage before you hit the mat. And... Boxing really, I mean, a lot of boxers come out of boxing with brain damage. They oh, yeah. they want to minimize that as much as possible. And and the only way that that round, yes, McGregor was going to get knocked out of that round. But along that pathway, he was going to suffer some long-term damage getting to that point. And there's no point in letting the fight get to that level um, because that, that just harms boxing as a sport and just it makes everything look bad. And obviously it's not in McGregor's best interests either. Yeah, exactly. It may, it may be more exciting to see him get knocked out, um, but in the long run, I think it's better for everybody. If he, oh. I mean, potentially, if he got knocked out, he wouldn't come back to MMA. Exactly. Yeah, and then, I mean, I assume he's going to go back to MMA. I mean, I'm sure he's, that he said that he is. So probably. Yeah, I'm sure that he is, and uh, you know, they advertised during the. I don't know if you. I'm sure. Sh- I'm sure they had it on all the pay per view that they advertised the uh, the Bisping GSP mm-hmm. fight. Yeah. Which uh, I'm really excited for that fight. I am, and I'm not. I'm I'm actually worried that uh, and Joe Rogan kind of talked about this on his podcast. I'm worried that GSP already has some some damage from yeah, fighting. That's fair. And uh, I, I'm worried that GSP has been retired for so long that he's going to go into that fight and Bisping's going to rock him and potentially hurt him. And I don't want to see that. I mean, I want to see yeah, an exciting fight, but I don't want to see either fight or get hurt. I, w- I want to see Bisping get knocked out. That guy is just such a dick. It's so funny because, I mean, I can remember the ultimate fighter. Oh, with him and, Di- and uh, Dan Henderson? And, I mean, it's just so bizarre to me. I mean, I haven't really fought, to be fair, I haven't really followed Bisping's career. But he's never really been a great fighter, and somehow he's a title holder. And I, and I just look at that and I'm like, I don't know how that guy is a title holder because he just doesn't have the skill set of yeah, world class fighters. Yeah, it's it's really strange. I mean, his one of his last fights before he got the title was that fight with uh, oh, what's his name, Kung Lee. Yeah. Uh, which he was a re- fighter who was retired for like three years before that fight. Uh. And of course he got 
beat up. And and that was like one of Bisping's stepping stones somehow yeah. to title contention. I don't I, I just don't understand the path of his career. Yeah. I mean, I can't see Bisping being around for too many more years with the amount of damage he's taken. Yeah. With the amount of shots he's taken. Um, I don't know that I don't know that GSP can win that fight. I think, you know, with, with the amount of damage GSP has taken over his career, with his age, uh, with the number of years he's been, because GSP's been out of it for like three or I mean, four years now. It's been at least four years. Yeah. It might it might have been five. That's um, that's a long way to come back. And in the last few fights that he had, he wasn't looking as good as he did in his prime. Not at all. Not um, at all. But again. I don't think Bisbing is a world. Well, I guess he's world class. I don't think he's champion level. Yeah, I mean, I just think that speaks to some of the talent that uh, that at that weight class that you know, ten years ago, five years ago, um, he wasn't a contender. And you know, obviously, it just means that the uh, the competition at that level just isn't there, or they just aren't giving him the fights. It should be at that level, in my opinion. Yeah, I I agree. Um. But either way, I'm, I think it's going to be an interesting fight. It's going to be an interesting fight. So uh, that one's going to be in a few months. That'll be a good one. We can talk about that. Uh, any other parting words, comments, or questions from our uh, audience? Uh, Bob Langmaid says Alvarez versus G- Golovkin will be the fight. I don't, I don't follow boxing as much, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, again, I'm not I'm not um I'm a casual boxer guy. Um I watch boxing when it's exciting fights, but I don't I don't go out of my way to watch boxing. MMA has been my thing for a very long time. Yeah, me too. Um I mean, if somebody's got it on, somebody I know has got it on, I'm sure I'll watch it, but I don't know if I'm going to catch that fight. We'll definitely uh catch the highlights after the yeah, fact, exactly. I'm sure. Maybe talk about it on the show. Um, but, uh, going back to the, uh, Camacho, uh, Imperial style barrel age, great cigar. Uh, love it. Um, looking forward to the next release of that. Uh, I think that'll be one I'll get my, my, my dirty hands on. Cause, uh, it's a good cigar. Yeah. It's a really good cigar. It's a really good cigar. Uh, hope everyone has enjoyed this hour and a half of sharing our pairings. As we mentioned, we'll be back tomorrow night with, um, hand rolled. That'll be a really, really good show. You want to tune in that. Make sure you get your questions in, get your weasel on. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow night. So thanks, everyone, who's tuned in live, sharing our pairings. Thanks to all of our podcast listeners out there in droves. Wherever you are in the world, thanks for supporting the show. Thanks for listening. Feel free to send your questions and comments to the show. As we always say on sharing our pairings, drink better, but drink less.